quality. Why space? It shouldn't be about money. That's something I want to be a part of. At a headline level, many people acknowledge that equality, diversity and inclusion, or having a mixture of different people and harnessing these differences in a positive way, is beneficial. However, it can be easy to fall into the trap of thinking that becoming inclusive is a once-off change that is implemented and then, voila, you're inclusive. Some people in organisations may feel that EDI is something that's being done to them rather than having a sense of joint ownership. How do we bring EDI to life in meaningful and sustainable ways? Welcome to Wide Skies. I'm Martin York. And I'm Debbie Watt. And joining us today are Anne-Marie Bainbridge. Anne-Marie is an experienced and passionate diversity and inclusion specialist working with organisations across multiple sectors to help their leaders create inclusive workplaces and cultures. She has recently focused on moving organisations from being not racist to anti-racist, which has required difficult and challenging, but nevertheless necessary conversations. She's also involved in the grassroots organisation Anti-Racist Cumbria, which aims to establish the UK's first anti-racist county. Welcome, Anne-Marie. Thank you. And also joining us is Melanie Wolfenden. Mel is an IT expert helping organisations to achieve business benefits from their investment in technology. She's a person of faith, has chaired a global LGBTQI plus employee network, and is a founding member of Pride in Tech, which facilitates LGBTQI awareness and inclusion across the technology sector. She is also a volunteer for AKT, a charity which provides support and advice for vulnerable and homeless young LGBTQI plus people. Welcome, Mel. Thank you. So if I could perhaps start the ball rolling um, and, and ask you both a good question to start at the summary level. What brief recap would you share for why equality, diversity and inclusion or EDI matters at the organisational level? So some key bullet points for what the tangible business benefits are. Our business is about people. And it's the right thing to do, treating people the right way. There should be no other better business benefit than serving, you know, our, our colleagues for the best we can. I'm Marie, yes, you can say Yeah, so. I was just going to add to what Mel said. All of that I completely agree with. And it's also if we treat people well, they will then deliver the service, the job to the best of their ability because they will feel like the organisation cares about them. It feels like for some organisations, maybe we're stuck in that infinite loop of discussing the business case for EDI and that it's not yet universally accepted. Yeah, I would say so. I, I, I read a report recently where McKinsey did some research around the business case, which traditionally we've always said to organisations, these are the things, it's about the bottom line, it's about all of those things, which is important. But actually, what it's saying is that it should be important in its own right. It shouldn't be about money, that you know, you're only doing this because actually these are, as Mel said, it's the right thing to do. It's just how we should do things rather than saying, well, unless there's, unless you can show me some pound signs or some dollar signs, then I'm not going to do it as a leader um, for my organisation. And there are business benefits. Obviously, you're going to improve your attention because mm-hmm, you're definitely. creating a culture where people feel that they are valued and important and therefore they want to stay they'll go out their way to go the extra mile for companies where they feel they're valued and they're supported and also for recruitment those messages you tell people how great your company is and and how much you enjoy being working there and that message gets out there and that encourages people to come and, and join that company as well we want to attract them and to keep them I think also increasingly because of the way social media and all of those things, lots of people, particularly younger people, look at that presence and say, if the organisation isn't demonstrably doing these things and tangibly doing these things, actually, it's not an organisation I want to go and work for. Yes. I talked to our, our junior talent and like you say, they're looking on social media, they're looking to say, hey, what are we saying about our sustainability? What are we saying about what we do yes. in the diversity and inclusion space? What yes. are we saying about what we're doing in our addressing these social issues, Black Lives Matter and etc.? What are those companies saying about these things and uh, publicly? And yes, they might be doing stuff behind closed doors, but what are they saying publicly? Mm. Because that's something I want to be a part of. And mm. it can't be just lip service. It can't just be a you come along, you've done a tra- you've done a training day, you know, you know all about it now. It has to be a yes. culture, a commitment. I remember particularly when Black Lives Matter gained prominence here. Um lots of organizations, for example, posted the Black Square. We're in support. But then what we need to do is dig a bit deeper and say, well, what have you done since? 
you know, yeah. what is the experience yes. of your black and brown colleagues working within the organization now? So is it just you're just doing it for performative way? Or is it is it deeper than that? Is it more embedded? Is it more mainstreamed? Is it more sustainable? It came to mind when you were saying about that of, of clearly Black Lives Matter and Pride are completely different topics, mm. but there are some very similar behaviours that happen that during the Pride season we see many organisations that have the rainbow colouring that appears on all the logos and everything and they have all these these wonderful Pride statements and for the rest of the year they do nothing. Exactly. And, and, and that is the same sort of level of superficiality yeah. that comes Lip through. Service. Yeah, there, there was a couple of words that really came out when I was observing the three of you talking about that then. And, and, and the first one was doing. Uh, so yes. it's not it's no good just to be saying you're going to do something. It, you, you are measured on your actions. And the second one was when you were discussing about recruitment and retention being the yes. important thing. I talk with, with many of my clients about the revolving door syndrome, where if an organisation doesn't deliver on its promises of what they advertise at the recruitment stage, those new candidates won't stay because they don't see the promises being acted upon. And that's definitely hitting the bottom line. You know, the cost of recruitment and training is Mm. big. But beyond just the lip service, do you think some people see EDI as a threat to their own positions or careers? I would say definitely. There's definitely a fear about the fact that, you know, a white middle class man is, it's much harder for them to try and get somewhere now because they feel that there's all these opportunities. And maybe it's just a perception, maybe it's not a reality. But there's this perception that unless you're LGBT or you're black or you're female or whatever, then you're going to be have like almost like a hindrance. It's almost like a handicap. I completely agree. And I think it's very much it can be seen as we're taking something away from you rather than yes. giving opportunities to people, you know, groups of people who historically have not had those opportunities. Yes. It's not making white middle class men question things that they don't have to qu- haven't had to question historically it's just automatically given and suddenly you're kind of made to think about well actually there are lots of groups of people who haven't had those opportunities and actually not only haven't had those opportunities but been actively blocked at times mm-hmm. from gaining those opportunities i mean i'm making an assumption here but i'm assuming that we're all of a single mind that what we're not saying is that all men are like that but but there, there are some that will find themselves caught in that situation and and, and not know quite how to react and and I think part of the challenge that I see particularly in smaller organisations is is finding the trick for everybody feeling like they're involved including that white middle class male Mm -hmm. who who maybe has has been afforded those societal norms that perpetuate uh, things being perhaps relatively easier for them and and they don't have the obstacles and don't see the obstacles that other people may experience it's really thinking about how, how we engage everybody along this and make it everybody's concern and and, and everybody can play a part in this absolutely and it's about recognizing you know it's become a bit of a pejorative at times in certain circles but it's about recognizing your privilege and just using that for good as i said it's a perception probably and a fear more than a reality i think so it's not that there are less chairs at the table we're just asking for more chairs at the table like you say recruitment or regression or whatever have to be the right person Mm. but i think what's really important is we make sure that we're actually got a number of candidates from different backgrounds having that opportunity to go for that position it's not who's recruited but it's more about who's in the room and being asked about and spoken to it was interesting to hear you all observing about the candidate experience and and of course nowadays particularly in the uk it's very much a candidate's market they can choose which employers they go to and employers are having to work harder to to compete uh, to secure the really good candidates and of course there are similar patterns that we're starting to see what we have seen for a number of years with with customer spending as well that if customers don't see themselves reflected in the organizational values of places they buy goods and services from then again the customers are very free and and it's very easy to move to alternative service providers it's much easier to sort of look around and say well who represents my values and do i want to either go and work for that organization or Do I want to buy goods and services from that organisation? We're seeing that quite a lot, aren't we? It's not Mm. just buying, like you say, we're saying buying goods. You know, plastic is a real thing at the moment. This whole thing of clamping down on plastic. I've even gone to the store and thought, actually, I can't. In fact, I can buy that in a paper bag because I can recycle that. Therefore, Mm. I'll buy that product and I might pay a little bit extra for that product, but I'll take that product because 
it meets with my values. I've bought sacks from organisations of dog food and they've come pre-wrapped in plastic. Well, they're already in a paper bag, so why does it need to be then coated in a plastic? When I can get it from another store and it comes in a, you know, delivered in a cardboard box, but I can then mm. at least use that cardboard, recycle it or whatever. So I'm going buy from there. It doesn't really matter about the yeah. cost the same. And it's only pence in it, so I would rather go for the one that meets my value. Mm. Yeah, we're all making ethical choices, aren't we? Customers and, of course, potential employers are, are much more informed nowadays than they used to be with, with having the internet and social media. It's much easier to find out about prospective employers, for example, and and, and, and to look up their values and, and, and see images of yourself represented in them or not, as the, as the case may be. Mel, you, you used to work for a, a very large global IT services organisation and you're now working for a much smaller organisation. And it's slightly earlier in its, its EDI journey, isn't it than the previous organization yes. that you worked for what's been your sort of compare and contrast experience of, of those two organizations and, and learning that you've been able to bring into them if i kind of look at back where with a larger organization they started that journey sort of back in 2015 there was that thing about trying to sell it to the business making the business case now there's a completely different mindset i think most senior leaders that are savvy recognize that actually diversity and inclusion is something that they need to do to make sure make them competitive i don't mm. think we've got the same challenge there the difference work is that we're having to do with leaders is help them to understand how they can do it it's not that they mm. don't want to do it one of the things that i've been, been doing is talking about belonging in our organization and yeah. nice. trying to create that culture it's creating that place where you feel valued and so that sense of belonging one of the ways that we've been doing that is actually just starting to talk about some of these topics in a work scenario so i started and one of the things the first things i did was i shared on the global platform about ramadan and how you could help your colleagues through ramadan it's not saying that everyone can do that but it's giving people an appreciation of the challenges that people are going to be doing if they're fasting getting up early in the morning to do prayer time being hungry if they're not having any water if it's really warm then obviously they're going to find that they're getting dehydrated as the day goes on you know so maybe mm. it's better to have some of those meetings and things early in the morning practical help that people can do and then people are sort of coming back and sort of saying wow we've never talked about this and about this in the workplace before this is fantastic can we talk about other things like that and mm. created that whole space and that whole opportunity to talk about well, you know not just faith but can we talk about disability and what we're doing in about lgbt and things like that really just creating that environment where people are willing to talk about it and it's safe to do it in work and i think it's worthwhile making the observation here as well that you aren't a follower of islam personally are you and so you're doing that in in the capacity of being an ally yes, rather exactly. than being a person who has a self-interest in that which i think is a really interesting thing to have when you're in a position of leadership and you find employees that work within your organization that are prepared to do this you know on very much a voluntary basis and they recognise the value of being an ally and supporting each other, it ripples far further than the intended audience because it sends a key message out to the rest of the organisation, doesn't it? I think one of the other key things it does is break down myths and stereotypes because if people don't know and they don't understand, lots of stuff around us, so the media, etc., can easily fill our heads with negativity around all of those issues taking the time to to do all of that and and making everybody have that sense of belonging i think it's really important to break some of those myths and stereotypes down yeah it's how we become us and a we rather than you know us and them it definitely humanizes Mm -hmm. things doesn't it which i think is is really important and i think it was interesting that you centered on the word belonging mel when Mm -hmm. you started engaging internally about this it can be sometimes easy to fall into the trap that inclusion in particular is is like like a, a finite project over there that's done by somebody and typically it will be done by HR to the rest of the business and really these are about basic values of sort of trust respect belonging loyalty and all those sort of things as well and you need to be consciously inclusive so I've been calling my leadership out about things that they can do to be consciously inclusive so making sure that when they're doing, you know, events and things, that there are representation from different people on the leadership team. So it's not just a bunch of white men. There's women on the leadership mm-hmm. team. There's people of colour on the leadership team. Why are we not seeing them? You know, things like that. And I think that's it. It's about being aware because often it's not that you're doing it on purpose. You're just you're not conscious that you're doing this activity. And one of the great things that worked in the previous organisation, I think, was we started a reverse mentoring scheme. Mm-hmm. And that enabled 
a leader to be with a person of faith or a person from a, a different minority background, just talking about how their privilege was different to the person that they were mentoring them, showing them what life in their organisation was like through a different set of eyes. And actually, that was a really powerful tool. And on the back of that, we did all sorts of projects, like looking at what it's like using the internal fi- IT systems through the mm. eyes of someone that's got a visual impairment. It's only when you get to experience that and see that through that person's lens that you start to understand actually this is not very inclusive and this is not very we're not doing things very well here the old uh, adage walking a mile in somebody else's shoes yes. came to mind yeah, definitely. Exactly. you might say well we haven't got many people of color and it's it's really it's hard work for them to have to feel like they've got to educate people but it's not and marie you've got a lot of experience in engaging with organizations one of the things is about getting buy-in from the top even if people are throughout the organization in terms of different levels if even if they are committed if you don't get that buy-in from the top then whatever they want to do can that can only go so far so it might be the fact that they give permission or they have a budget or whatever it is that needs to to happen. But there has to be that buy-in from the top. Otherwise, it it, it becomes, you then get the sort of barriers and you get the glass ceiling or concrete ceiling sometimes in the way because people can only go so far because they don't have the power to move things on. I think the other thing that is key, if you don't have that buy-in from the top, EDI is not given the resources and that can be, the people, it can be money, it can be time, the whole range of things that that just won't happen because it's not seen as valuable. And also something Martin mentioned earlier about it sitting with HR, in my mind, it's a leadership responsibility. It's a business responsibility. Not that HR shouldn't get involved. For me, that signifies it's people that are, are, are at fault, you know, so they do the people management side of things. Or oh, it's some it's it's about the people. And actually, going back to our conversation around the business case, it, it should be part of how the organization does business rather than sitting with HR necessarily. As I said, not to say that HR shouldn't get involved. Unless they're sat at the leadership table. And none of my HR colleagues would say we should be at the leadership table too. Yeah. So it really is like you say, where that power yeah. is, where that influence is. There is a marked difference between organisations where you have leaders who say, yes, great, go ahead and do it. And those organisations where you have leaders that will roll the sleeves up and do things. Mm. Because if if you don't see personal commitment and the active involvement of a leader, it sends the wrong signal down the organisation that they've said it, but they're paying lip service to it and they're not really committed. And commitment is incredibly important. It's like, here's a tick box, you've done that training, tick. Relating to Black Lives Matter, Mm. Um, lots of organisations came out, went to the Black Square, et cetera, et cetera. So Nike was one of the ones that did the Black Square. And and actually, their business model is lots of their outward-facing representatives are various black athletes. You would imagine that as a corporation, because they're massive, you know, obviously international, they would be very much along those lines. But actually, one of the, the staff groups for black and brown staff. Nike went to Facebook or Meta, I think they're called now, but owns WhatsApp and asked them to take it down because there were lots of negative comments about their experiences. But instead of going to the group and saying, you know, we're really sad that you, you, you've you got these issues and let's talk, what they did was they didn't want it to become public, which it has anyway. Um, so they took the group down. Mm. And that's an example of we're saying one thing outwardly, but actually internally, we're not practicing what we preach. Are there any other common mistakes and pitfalls that you see happening? Budgets that only go for so long. So it might be, you know, other other initiatives within organisations might get almost a rolling budget or a budget for, say, five years or, or more. Whereas my experience for some organisations is that they give a very fine, either a finite piece of a budget so you can have x to do this or they don't give you a huge budget and you have to sort of almost pick bits of, of, of budget from other other areas so not committing to it in a really a way that's really going to make a difference the commitment needs to have longevity yes. rather than just like piecemeal and i think that's where businesses want that 
what are we going to see for it? What are we going to see for that money? Mm. How are you going to quantify that it's been good? There is business benefits behind it. And I think linking to that, Mel, is something about not necessarily having a seat at the table, but certainly having representation at the table. But it's also about linking goals, etc., to the business. Yes. If you just want to have a few socials, that's fine and it's not a bad no. thing. But actually, if you have like a, a set of, of aims and objectives and say, OK, well, what are we going, what, what do we want to achieve and link that to the goals and uh, aims and objectives of the business so that they can see that link as well? Yeah, just clever measuring, just recognising that when you do have those events, you're going to have higher uh, satisfaction from the staff group. You're going to have higher retention. All those things will go up, but you have to measure them. You have to look at the metrics you're using. I have a shared history with Mel from an ex-employer. One of the things that we did for the LGBT plus network at the time was there were an increasing number of customers in a sales situation that were coming to us as an organisation and saying, can you demonstrate how you engage with your employees and what do you do in the spaces of diversity and inclusion? And we want to see that in your bid documentation. And so there was a direct link between doing these things and winning business. And it was really important that we were able to quantify those things that we did. Observation for when you were talking uh, earlier on, Anne-Marie, about the challenges with budget, that it invariably comes up. If it's a really tiny budget that you're given and, and, and you're, you're encouraged to scrimp and save and try and secure little pots of money from elsewhere, the message that that sends is that we aren't really committed to this. And if it's mm-hmm. a finite lifespan budget that you're given, then again, it's we think as an organization that you're going to do this and then suddenly we're inclusive and of course that isn't the case is it because we have to continue this as a living breathing thing that's part of an organization exactly and i I think that's where lots of organizations and lots of leaders within organizations don't have that forward thinking view around all of it one of the things i often talk about edi is about all of us Mm. yeah so it's not trying to exclude people for historical reasons, there are groups of people who have experienced disadvantaged or been discriminated against. And what we're trying to do is readjust the balance. But it is about all of us. Some of the last couple of years of me leading an LGBT group was we were working on how can we actually empower our allies. We had a social aspect which allowed the LGBT people to get together, but we also were looking at what can we do to help allies on their journey. They wanted to come to Pride. They wanted to come and march with us in Pride. They wanted to be visible and be seen. Mm-hmm. They wanted to bring their families along, and they then yes. were saying, "Well, why mm-hmm. can't we?" They were yeah. making the journey happen. You know, it was amazing. <laughs> you know, we had more allies and we had LGBT people in the group. <laughs> fantastic but they wanted to be associated with it so what he said was how can we help others so if you're fortunate that you work for an organization that has got a big pride budget or whatever else or you know you've got that chance to do that invite your customers invite your small businesses to come and walk with you give them an opportunity because they maybe not be able to afford to have a float on pride or whatever or have a marching group or have enough Mm. people so from a small organization point of view it can really be empowering for those people that might not have that opportunity normally the work i do with anti-racist cumbria is very much we have lots of black and obviously black and brown members but we've also got a lot of white allies and it's about bringing all of those people together because there is a genuine desire to get involved and to help and yes. commitment so when we talk about anti-racism we, we talk about people being on a journey mm-hmm. people are at different points in that journey so not everybody knows everything but we've created a, a, a bit like you were saying Mal, about that sense of belonging so that people aren't quite sure about something. They can ask the question and it's all about learning because everyone has different strengths and different levels of knowledge. So I think that's really, really important to have those allies sort of brought in. That links really nicely to a question that, that, that we were going to pose to you anyway about how smaller organisations might learn from larger ones. I think the example that you gave, Mel, about larger organisations inviting smaller organisations to take part in events is great. And I, I guess from the smaller organisation perspective, there's something there about working your networks and, and business contacts that you have. Is, is there anything else that you would recommend? I think it's that making yourself vulnerable and listening. As an organisation, you need to start listening to what people people saying where else might leaders reach out to other than organizations that they do business with to help out on this because of the way things are going at the moment Mm. that sense of social justice i think is much much bigger now than it ever was before so people are looking at things and thinking what can i do to help so i think there are lots of probably local organizations that people can reach out to 
to find out more or what can I do to help? Let me, you know, go and do some volunteering mm. or something like that. A suggestion for if you're in a smaller organisation and you're thinking about approaching a grassroots organisation or a community group and you, you, you might have apprehension about whether they might want money in return for services and advice mm. that they might provide, that you can actually think more creatively about that because it may be that you can provide something on an old-fashioned barter system basis to them that they need frequently charities and startup groups and things need money to be able to pay for bills or to be able to buy goods and services and it might be that you can provide those goods and services to them you might be able to provide them a little bit of mentoring maybe if you have an accountant that works for you and they could spend them an hour uh, you might have a meeting room that they could use to hold a meeting and so all of those mm-hmm. things come into play it's not always about the money that there's there's usually some sort of exchange you can do that's mutually beneficial another way you can find out more get involved etc is there's lots of stuff online that you can tap Mm -hmm. into reports um guides you know lots of organizations will publish guides how to do something there's a lot of useful resource out there definitely if you know that there's an organization that's doing something really well in that space most organizations that are quite happy to share think about reaching out to them people are so willing ultimately Mm. we're not just organizations we're a community you know we're a community bringing all the organizations together we're people um, but yeah, the, the only thing I'd add with that is some of the resources, some of the membership organisations like the British Psychological Society for done a lot of research and also the Chartered Institute of Personal Development, so CIPD. Uh, so it's well worth looking at some of those if you just want to get some more research information. And certainly thinking about different market sectors mm-hmm. that some listeners might be in as well. If you're a member of a trade body, yes. then go to your trade body membership organisation and ask them if they can recommend anything. Yeah. Federation of Master Builders, yes. for example, they have some good practice guides. Yeah. So it spans across different sectors. If you're looking for a particular guide or a how-to or a best practice in a specific area that you know next to nothing about personally, then what you want to do is to look for two or three examples of it and compare them and to see whether they're all saying the same thing or not so, you know, or go to an organisation that you have a relationship with and ask them for their view on it or if you have an employee uh, ask them for their view on it as well so yeah always worthwhile just checking to make sure there's a report that we'll put a link on to for the episode which is uh, from the consulting company PwC and it's about uh, qualities of an inclusive leader and one of the key things that comes out of that is spend time with people that are not like you because that's one of your areas for growth. The police have a independent advisory group. Each force has one. So I sit on the one for Cumbria. So again, that gives me a broader perspective around things going on in, in sort of the community and, and more, you know, the local, local area. But I also am a board member for a local arts organisation. Mm-hmm. So again, that gives me, again, another different perspective. So it, it, it's kind of broadening out my my you know my experience and my understanding and also opportunities to ask different people about their advice about different Mm. areas what tip would you share with someone trying to get buy-in as a leader you really educate yourself and think about what do you want to achieve ultimately you know what what's the goal within your team or for the organization as a whole and Think about the value that the broadest diversity of people can bring and and how can you can best include them. We're not all fortunate to be leaders or fortunate to have that experience or that that voice at the table. So I think there's kind of a couple of tips. One, you can challenge your leaders and say, what are you doing in this space? But also start within your small group. Be your only tap into team members. Talk about stuff that's not just work. Make it human. Talk about these other things mm. that are going on. I think creating that safe space for people to talk and just doing your own little bit like that. Use what powers and privileges you have. I think that's really good because a lot of the time, if you open up the space, the safe space for discussion, you'll find about a lot of diversity you have in your workforce that you don't know because people yeah. don't usually bring it to the table caring responsibilities, mm. what's happening with children, etc. I'd like to contribute mm. one into this as well. I, I, I think it, it sort of builds on some of the things that, that Mel has just said, and it's about talking with authenticity of why this matters and make it part of the everyday. Who would you recommend as EDI role models? What I do do is I've just started doing something called the 30-day inclusion challenge. It challenged me just to step outside my own comfort zone just listen to some people other people's perspectives it was some really powerful messages on there some very powerful viewpoints and really challenging that made me think about my own privileges i'm thinking about sir lenny henry 
who, who talks quite passionately about yes. uh, about lots of issues around this. Uh, Martin Lewis. So he's not, he doesn't set himself up as an EDI specialist or anything like that, but he's just so passionate mm. about helping people who are less fortunate. He's obviously talking specifically about some, some financial issues at the moment, but actually he's touched on some other things that link to all of those things. I'd like to recommend two. two. One's an individual role model. The other one is an example of uh, an information source that has a role model on it. Uh, so I'll do the second one mm-hmm. first, which is TED Talks. Yes. I think TED Talks are excellent and there are so many great speakers on there. One in particular that I would recommend uh, is the late Stella Young. Um, She did an amazing speech. She was a disability rights campaigner and she did a really incredible speech that was called I'm Not Your Inspiration, Thank You Very Much. Um, And for anybody who needs an insight into disability inclusion, that's well worth a watch or a listen. The other one I would recommend is the uh, campaigner for uh, food poverty and and household poverty, Jack Munro, Mm -hmm. who you may know better as Bootstrap Cook and they are very active on social media uh, and campaign vigorously for people who are really struggling with with very tight budgets nowadays. Uh, They also wear the heart on the sleeve in terms of of their experience of being neurodivergent, so it's a real insight into people's neurodivergent lives. Once again, we've come to the end of our episode. We always seem to run short of time, um, and it's been absolutely thrilling to have both of you with us. Uh, Thank you so much, Anne-Marie Bainbridge. Thank you, Martin. And Mel Wolfenden. Martin. Thank you. Here's my self-care tip. White Skies Self-Care So you've probably set a SMART goal at some point in your life. You know, the goals which are specific, measurable, attainable, realistic and time-bound. Now, you probably did this in work or in education, and you may even have supported others to set goals. But did you find that the goals were achieved? Or, like me and many of my coaching clients, the wins, if there were wins, were short-lived or you were unsuccessful and you may have even stopped setting goals completely. This tip is how to make smarter smart goals and hopefully achieve your aims. We're still going to use the same letters, but we're going to change the A and the R. So smart is now specific, measurable, aligned, resourced and time-bound. I'm going to use one of my goals as an example. Specific. Okay, I want to get healthier. I want to improve my fitness through walking. Okay, that works. Measurable. How much, how frequently, how many? I want to walk two to three miles once or twice a week. Aligned. Now we're more likely to achieve goals that fit with what's important to us, our values. So I like spending time with others, spending time outside and being thrifty saving money, not wasting money. So a walk in the countryside with friends would fit the bill. Resourced. Do I have the resources I need to achieve my goal? Okay, I have somewhere to walk. I live near fields. I have a waterproof jacket. I have wellies. I have trainers. I've got all the clothes I need to walk in any different weather. Do I have the time? That's a good resource. Okay, I have time at weekends and perhaps once in a week. And I can badger my partner and a couple of friends in the village to hopefully come for a walk with me. Time bound. I want to be walking by the end of the month and for this to be the start of an ongoing habit. So my initial goal is going to be a two to three mile walk each week by the end of the month. I've set my goal to be realistic. So if I can do two walks a week, that's brilliant. But one walk is going to fit my goal. And if I manage to go with company, that's even better. So have a think about what you'd like to achieve and try my smarter smart framework. Remember, specific, measurable, aligned, resourced and time bound. Good luck. White Skies Self-Care Thank you very much for listening. We really hope you've enjoyed it. And a big thanks to our guests, Anne-Marie Bainbridge and Melanie Wolfenden. We very much look forward to catching up with you on our other episodes. And here's a reminder about how you can get in touch and how to access the captioned versions of this podcast. Contact us at linktree slash wide skies, where you can also find a link to the captioned version of this podcast. And it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Inclusion, diversity, equality, wide space, a podcast.
podcast produced and edited by Majoya Consulting in collaboration with Bridgeborn Psychology.